Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this privilege to come before you. We just pray that you would be in the midst of this service. We ask that your spirit would rest upon this place and upon this broadcast. That whoever, whether they're worshiping with us now or worshiping with us later, that they would just feel your presence and be changed for it. We know that we can't do this service without you. So we just pray that you would inhabit this space and that you would receive the praise and the worship that we have for you today and be with us during this time of fellowship as we do what it says in your word and forsake not the assembly. We just thank you for the technology that makes it possible for us to still come together during these times. And we pray for all of those who just might be feeling isolated and alone during this time that you would strengthen them and be with them and just allow them to know that they are loved, that you love them, that we love them. And we pray that you would have your way through the service and through all that we do today and that your light will shine through all of us. These things we ask in your son, Jesus' name, amen. So good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us for service today. Um, We appreciate you on this being the last Sunday in August, and it's hard to believe that, well, even though from a technical, like, seasonal perspective, there's still a few more weeks of summer, you know, kids have already started going back to school, (laughs) vacations are winding down, Employers are already talking about bringing us back into the office, you know, five days per week. So for those of us who haven't been yet, at least. So it's just saying that in a lot of ways, the end of August does kind of feel like the end of a season. And we know that next week is Labor Day weekend, which a lot of people see as the end of the summer. So, you know, if you use that definition, this is the last Sunday of the summer. And so, you know, it's hard to believe that it's gone by so quickly because I feel like, I don't know about you, this has been one of the fastest and slowest summers ever at the same time. Fast in some ways, it's like, wow, this weather is, you know, we only have a few months of nice warm weather in this part of the country. And so it's going by so quickly. But then in other ways, the summer has been pretty slow, you know, partly because of all the different storms that have been happening, all the different political issues that have been happening. So... Yeah, fast and slow at the same time, but we're thankful that God has kept us thus far, you know, this year and in this pandemic, because, you know, every time we think it's ending, it seems like the rules change a bit. But, you know, we're thankful. God is faithful. We're all still here. And we thank you all who've been watching us, who've been praying for us, sending us kind words behind the scenes, donating. We thank you all because, you know, pastoring in this context is different than what anybody would have ever imagined you know there's not anything in, I've been to seminary there's not anything in seminary that prepares you for how to pastor online during a pandemic but we thank you for your kindness and your support you know your willingness to go along with us and just understand things are going to be a little different for a while things are going to be a bit unorthodox for a bit but God is still here and so we thank you all for trusting us um during this season and since we always thank you for your support this is also the time where I encourage those of you who feel so led to share our service on your social media so if you're watching live with us right now you can share it on Facebook or if you're watching later on whether you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube you can also share because this is how people find out that we exist you know so many churches have had to beef up their technology within this past few Well, I guess past year and a half now, the pandemic. So the blessing is that, you know, we all can worship with people all over the world if we want to. And we all can even attend other services behind our regular service. So, you know, that is a blessing. But as a result, there's so many churches out there that it's almost like searching for a needle in a haystack. So if you feel like we've been that needle in a haystack for you, (laughs) feel free to share um, with people on your social media and I am about to share right now so if you are my friend on Facebook and I see that first lady just shared as well 
So if you are my friend on Facebook, oh, I see a few shares went through. So this is great. Thank you all. So as I was trying to say, though, if you are my friend on Facebook, once my phone finishes loading correctly, you will also see um, that I have shared, oh yeah, seven shares already. Thank you all. And I guess my share is about to make it number eight. So, that it, so if you are my friend on Facebook or you just follow my social media in general, you'll see today's service with the caption happening right now. So, and again, thank you all, those of you who shared. So what I'm going to do, oh, and if you didn't feel led to share, it's all right. We still appreciate you. We love you. And we're glad that you're here watching with us, praising with us, worshiping with us, you know. No pressure. So now I'm going to move into our song for today, which is, yeah, a bit of a standard around here. Um, you are holy. So those of you who've been watching our services and participating in this ministry, even before it became an online ministry, probably know this song. And if you don't, it doesn't have a whole lot of words to it. So, yeah, I hope you'll be able to catch on. And I'll imagine that I can hear you all singing with me.
can search the heavens high. I can search the earth below, but there's no All right, thanks everybody. Um, so first ladies, let me know there aren't any announcements that we have today, but um, as always, we do want to let you all know that if you write your comments um, you know, live, you write your prayers as a comment, um, we will come back to your prayers at the end of service. And I already see that some of you have been writing those through, so feel free to continue doing that and we'll let you know again the last time you have to do it so that we can pray for you during service and if you end up you know submitting a prayer request after service we'll still pray for you it just won't end up making a live broadcast so we thank you for that um so now give me a second to drink some tea because even though it's not allergy season it kind of feels like it it's always allergy season for me yeah they can't hear what you said but she said, first lady said, it's always allergy season for her. So if you didn't hear that echo, that's what it was. <laughs> it's true, it is always allergy season for her, but usually I have distinct allergy seasons, but not this year because the weather has just been so unusual. I mean, I know I've said this before, this has got to be the rainiest summer we've ever had in this part of the country. Like it felt like every week, and I know this because we were always trying to coordinate our yard work and things like that around times when it wasn't raining. And it just kind of felt like it rained in some form almost every week this summer. And not just rain, but tornadoes, hurricanes, tropical storms, floods. You know, it's just, it's been interesting in terms of the weather. And I guess some of that would make 
allergies worse for allergy sufferers. Sister Renee said it's allergy season for her all year round. I can relate. Yes, all year round. Yes. Um, Because there's always something to be allergic to. (laughs) That is true. (laughs) And also, we'll be sure to pray, as you were talking about weather and just all the rain and and things that we've been experiencing, we are going to make sure that we pray um, for those in Louisiana. Um, oh, yeah, that's right, because they're evacuating right now. There is evacuation. Right. I have not checked this morning as to see what the status of the hurricane is. But we'll be sure to pray either way, because when there are storms like this, you know, there's going to unfortunately be somebody who's affected, even if it's not a Category 5. That's there's going to be some property damage, some flooding. Like this, we already know anytime. Even something as mild as a tropical storm comes through. So that, that's right. You're talking about um, Hurricane Ida, which is still heading toward the Gulf Coast right now. I, I can't tell if it's actually made landfall, but it's bad bad enough that you know that whole region. A lot of people are evacuating, and we know what happened with Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita. And if you know anything about the New Orleans area, you know that a lot of it is like below sea level. So the only thing that keeps a lot of those areas dry is the existence of the levees. And we know what happened with Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita, the levees failed, mm-hmm. which led to flooding in areas that you know people weren't prepared to deal with because the levees weren't supposed to break. So yeah, it would just be in prayer for that region, as First Lady said, because there are so many things that um, will make such a hurricane hitting that area devastating. I mean, I know like we've talked about the uh, interaction with politics and all this, but understanding that this infrastructure bill that's trying to go through would also help with some of these issues, you know, like areas in this country that are dependent on levees for survival and, you know, just putting out there that everything is connected in a way. But yeah, we will be sure to keep our friends and family in the path of Hurricane Ida in prayer because yeah it looks like it's there right now actually would, would you like to pray for them now then okay and I okay and I saw from uh our sister Michiko that she has a niece there so we're going to pray for her all right oh let us pray father god we come to you um in need father because we know that um your provider your protector lord we pray for everybody who is in the path of hurricane ida we pray for New Orleans, Lord. We pray for all the surrounding counties, Lord. We pray for anybody who is still on the highway and trying to evacuate and get out, Lord. We just pray that, first and foremost, that you will encamp your angels around them and just keep them safe, keep them alive, Lord. We pray that um, you will provide what people need in order to survive this time. Um, We pray that you will soften any hearts of any um lawmakers so that any emergency um monies or aid that needs to go to the region will be sent there without delay lord we pray for um any of our service people that are going to end up going out there to help um we pray that you um make them their brain sharp and wise and help them to um really care for the people out there we pray for michiko's niece sadie We pray for her safety um, as she is down there weathering this storm out. Um, We pray for everybody that could not evacuate, Lord. Um, Please keep them safe. Please keep their houses from being flooded. We pray for um, everyone that did evacuate, Lord, that they have something to, to come back to. And that above all, that you just give folks a just a... Um, a peace that surpasses all understanding, Lord. Um, 
because there might be some questions of why. There might be some questions of, you know, why me? How did this happen? How am I going to deal with this? But we just pray that you provide folks whatever they need, whether it be uh, mental peace, spiritual peace, um, financial. Um, we just pray that you provide and you know what they need. And um, above all else, just keeping people safe and, and saving lives. These things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, thank you, First Lady, for that prayer and for reminding us of what's happening um, in that region of the country right now. All right, so now we're going to move on to today's message. So if you can find in your Bibles um, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm beginning at verse 1. So I'll give you all a few seconds to find it. Feel free to type amen through um, a comment so that we'll know you're there as well. But yeah, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. I see the amen that came through. So it reads thus For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to a man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. So today, if you're taking notes, the title of today's message is The Attractiveness of Bad Decisions. That is, The Attractiveness of Bad Decisions. So... Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for keeping us thus far, for keeping us in the midst of this service. We thank you for the time we've already spent together and the fellowship that you allow for us to have in the time of praising and worshiping you. And now we pray as we come to this preaching moment that you would remove me and use me as a vessel to speak to these, your people, to give them a word from you that will help all of us to be better representatives in this world and in the society where you've placed us and to make more sense of the things we see going on around us. These things we ask in your son, in Jesus' name, amen. So this week in particular, I guess because things have been so challenging and interesting, I've been thinking a lot about the milk crate challenge. Now for those of you who don't know what that is, it's one of those social media challenges, largely on TikTok, but also on Instagram and a bit on Facebook, during which people record themselves walking up and down, often high step formations made of milk crates. And of course, as anyone who's ever been around a milk crate knows, these, fo these formations are not going to be stable at all because milk crates are not stable. They're not designed to hold human weight, especially when you stack them. Um, and so more often than not, these challenges end in injury instead of triumph, you know? which is not really a good idea right now when you consider that we're still in the middle of a pandemic and 
in some parts of our country, our hospitals are already being overrun in part because of the fact that there are so many in this country who aren't taking the pandemic seriously and aren't taking the basic measures that can help prevent the spread of COVID-19. But getting back to the challenges, um, as I watched some of the videos, I found myself becoming a bit confused. I mean, yes, I do know why challenges have become so popular, especially during this pandemic. As human beings, we are social creatures and the social distancing measures that we've had to employ because of the pandemic have made a lot of us feel pretty isolated. And so in order to feel like we're still together and a part of something, you know, these challenges have become more popular. In other words, it's the same reason why a lot of us, well, to some extent, the same reason. I mean, some of this has to do with faith as well. But you can think of it as the same impulse that leads a lot of us to come to these services, you know, online. You know, we can't come together the way that we would like to come together because it's not safe to do so for most of us. Some of our churches have reopened. But, you know, this online ministry in a lot of ways is the next best thing for us to feel like we're a part of something and not feel so isolated. So I understand that part, you know, psychologically. So that's not where my confusion comes from. My confusion comes from the reason that people seem to be ignoring the potential for injury that comes with it. I mean, I can admit that watching some of the people fall was hilarious. I mean, sad to say, but it was. People who know me know that one of my weaknesses, one of the things that I am most likely to laugh at is somebody falling. And I can imagine that my mom and my cousin who are watching right now are probably laughing because they know that's true. It's something that we all share on that side of family. Just let somebody trip and we're all kind of on the ground laughing. So, of course, you know, especially when you see the videos where people edit the many falls that have taken place during this challenge together, they're usually pretty funny. I mean, because sometimes you can pretty much like predict how the video is going to end before many in the videos even take their first step. But with so many people falling and hurting their bodies as well as their pride, I just still couldn't understand why so many other people were quick to think, wow, this looks like fun. Like, I, you know, I still don't get it. But so as I prayed about it, God began to show me just how common this sort of thinking is. I mean, because even when people know better, as in this case, when you have thousands of examples on the Internet of people falling and hurting themselves, um, people don't always do better in spite of having the knowledge to know what they shouldn't do. You know, we're quick to assume that the poor decisions that we make in our life are the result of a lack of knowledge. And that is true sometimes, but not always. Sometimes people have all the knowledge and information and wisdom they need in order to make a good decision and still end up making a bad one. I mean, this is especially true in our society today when you think about that we are the most connected generation possible, well, society possible, thanks to you know our smartphones. You know, we kind of have the equivalent of forget in fact, I would just age myself a little bit that growing up, my mom got me a set of world book encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. And we were really excited, you know, to have that kind of knowledge, all those books in our house, because it meant I didn't have to go to the library to do my school reports and things like that. And then, you know, as I got a little bit older, the world book encyclopedias were now obsolete, and everybody had an like, Encyclopedia Britannica or one of those on a CD. And it's like, wow, this one CD has all the information from like these 20 books. Well, this small thing that can fit in my pocket that every one of you has right now, if you're not looking at it right now to um, watch the service, has access to more information than many libraries have um, in the world. So it's safe to say that we have a lot of information at our fingertips, more so than any generation before us had. So in a lot of ways, you think, well, if knowledge and information was a thing to keep us from making bad decisions, why do we make so many bad decisions when we have so much information in front of us? So, and so to help me to understand this a bit, God brought me to this passage in 1 Corinthians 10. And in the passage, the Apostle Paul, who was the writer, talks about how the children of Israel continued to dishonor God in spite of their knowledge of all the things God had done for them through their miraculous history. The passage itself is a warning to the Christians of the church of Corinth. Um, 
so that they can learn from the mistakes of the children of Israel who came before them, now that they, as Gentiles, were recipients of the blessings associated with the covenant God made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And they were recipients of these blessings thanks to their belief in Jesus. So I know that was a bit of a mouthful, but bear with me. I'll make it clearer as we come through. Still, there's a lot we can learn from this passage about why we and the people around us can make obviously horrible decisions in spite of knowing better. And also, it gives us some ideas of how we can curb um, those issues when they come up in our life, you know, that trend toward wanting to make a bad decision. And so because of that, that is actually what the goal of this message is, get a better understanding of how we make bad decisions, why we make bad decisions, and what we can do to make better decisions. But before we go on to the message itself, um, I just need to give you a little bit more background. You know, I tend to do this with every message. And you can recall that the book of 1 Corinthians is actually a letter written from the Apostle Paul to the Christians in Corinth. So as an apostle, Paul was responsible for planting the churches. So effectively, when you think about it, the reason that the Christian church still exists today is because of the work that the apostles did in the book of Acts. And so if you read the book of Acts, you find that Paul was traveling all over and, you know, preaching the gospel and establishing churches and training leaders and all that. That was his mission for the rest of his life after he met Jesus on that road to Damascus. And so after planting these churches, how Paul stayed in touch with the churches was through writing them. See, we refer to this as an epistle. Epistle is just a fancy word for letter. So in addition to the many letters that he wrote, well, this was one of the letters he wrote to the Corinthians, but you know that in the New Testament, a lot of the books in the New <laughs> Testament are actually letters that Paul was writing to the churches he helped to establish. And he often wrote these letters while he was imprisoned, you know, because even if he couldn't move and go minister to these people and help them, the letters could still reach them. And as letters are, you know, these letters were written in response to specific issues that Paul heard about or knew were happening in the context that he was writing to. And because letters are conversations, we know that this particular epistle, like all of them, is only one side of a conversation. So we don't know, in a lot of cases, what Paul was actually responding to. We just know that these letters would have been a part of ongoing conversations between Paul and the leaders of the churches that he was writing to. And so yeah, that is pretty much you know what you need to know about the book of First Corinthians. So I'm going to give some more details later as it becomes more relevant to this message. But in getting to my first point, the first point is this. At least based on what um, the Apostle Paul wrote in this letter, we find that the children of Israel were closer to God collectively than any other people in the world and still made mistakes. So because of the covenant, as I mentioned earlier, that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the children of Israel had a relationship with God that no other people group in the world had. They were God's chosen people. You know, I've explained that later that changes in how we are able to access those promises now as believers. But in the time period that Paul was writing about at the beginning of chapter 10, that was the time period where the children of Israel were God's chosen people. They were the only ones that heard from God. They were the ones that God favored. They're the ones that God had chosen. So they had a special relationship with God. And Paul found it necessary to outline just how special this relationship was. You know, in, his, in these few verses, he mentions that they were under the cloud. And that refers to how during the time of the Exodus, as they journeyed to the promised land, during the day, the Lord's glory formed a cloud over them, which we refer to as the Shekinah glory, in order to cover them while they were making their journey so that their enemies couldn't see them during the day. And we also know that the same cloud lit their way at night. When, Mo, when um, Paul mentions that they ate the same spiritual food, he's referring to how God sent them manna from heaven in order to feed them while they were um, making their journey. And he also provided them, I think, quail as well. Like 
to make sure that every need they had would be met while they made this journey that God had ordained for them. And even when Paul mentions how they drank the same spiritual drink and makes a reference to the rock being Christ, he's referring to that passage in Exodus that we find where he tells Paul to wave his staff, and that's Paul, he tells Moses to wave his staff in front of the rock and then water would come from it. And of course, Moses ended up disobeying and hitting the rock, which was why Moses ended up not being able to go to the promised land himself. But the point is, these were all miraculous things that the children of Israel witnessed and had a part of their history. And this is not even including, you know, all the things they saw during their journey out of Egypt. So the point is, God was with them, and there were miracles happening left and right. And in spite of all these miracles that they witnessed and that were a part of their history, um, the children of Israel still strayed and strayed often. Like Paul points out that in spite of this amazing testimony, God wasn't pleased with most of them. That's why a whole generation had to die out before they could get into the promised land. You know, in fact, Paul describes them as idolaters, immoral, tempting the Lord, and grumbling. You know, and you heard me read it. Like he really did say those things. So what can we learn from this? Some of us can have amazing testimonies of deliverance and God's protection and still not learn anything. I mean, that's right. Like God can work miracles on our behalf, but a lot of us won't change even after seeing those miracles. And that's kind of hard to digest because some of us are like, well, you know, if this thing happened now, like what happened back then, there's no way I would have made that mistake. But a lot of us in our lives experience what could be considered miracles on a daily basis. You know, like the miracle of waking up every morning. You know, and still are like, we take those things for granted. We don't see God's hand on our life the way that we should. But to give a more in-depth example, I'm going to borrow from one of my favorite TV shows this year, David Makes Man, which comes on OWN, the Oprah Winfrey Network. So written by fellow Yaley Terrell Alvin McCraney, who's best known for his work on Moonlight, the Academy Award-winning picture. Um, it follows the story of a teenage boy named David. He's very intelligent. He lives in the projects with his mother, who's struggling with addiction, and his younger brother. And in the first season, we watch David deal with the death of his drug dealer mentor, finding out that his best friend was being abused, code switching when he went back and forth to school, watching out for his little brother, and trying hard to get into a competitive private high school that would be his ticket out of the life that he was living. And I really enjoyed that show a lot, especially the first season, because like Moonlight, it spent a lot of time focusing on the thoughts and feelings of black men in a way that usually doesn't happen in our media. I mean, the characters that Terrell Alvin McCraney writes um, are allowed to be emotional and complex in a society that would usually reduce black men, especially big, tough-looking black men, into caricatures. And I bring this up because when we get to the second season of the show, which takes place about 15 years after the first, um, with, of course, the original cast appearing largely through flashbacks or times to show just how many things don't change as people grow up, um, by that point, it throws everything that I came to understand about the show on its head a bit. Because by now, David and his friends were all young adults with successful careers. But of course, not everything is as it seems. Um, in spite of having just about everything he wanted, you know, he did get to that private school. That private school led him to get to the Ivy League. The Ivy League led him to get this powerful job in urban planning. But in spite of all of that, he doesn't seem happy. In fact, he's really cold and distant and stilted and repressed. And eventually he ends up in therapy. He's very reluctant to go at first, as, you know, most black people are. But after a very bad day, terrible, terrible day, if you watch the show, he realizes that he needs it. And when he finally takes this, it seriously, you know, because the first few sessions, he's kind of going back and forth with the therapist. There's one whole episode where the therapist helps him break through some of the trauma he's experienced, you know, largely with references to the first season of the show. And as they're going back and forth about his life and the things he had been through, the therapist points out to him that he seems to create chaos in his life. And why would he do that? Because that chaos is familiar to him. That's, he's had to live his life in chaos for so long 
growing up as a child with the trauma that he experienced that he feels like his life is off kilter without it. So whether consciously or subconsciously, he puts himself in situations so that he can have that familiar feeling again. So that's right. In other words, David, the character, couldn't handle the peace that was coming in his life with the things he'd accomplished. He was so accustomed to the struggle from his childhood that he created situations that replicated that struggle as he became an adult. So needless to say, that hit close to home for me in some ways because I know I find myself procrastinating sometimes because I do feel that sometimes I work better under pressure. And maybe some of you can relate to this as well. Maybe things may seem too simple, so you make them more complicated because you just don't trust that simplicity. Like maybe you're always looking for the other shoe to drop. I know I suffer with that sometimes too. Well, that inability to trust or feel good when things just seem too simple and too straightforward That is the one potential explanation for why the children of Israel acted the way they did as well. Because see, although God had delivered them and had given them everything they needed to be productive and healthy people, God gave them directions over and over again in the form of his law. You know, they seemed intent on making their lives as difficult as possible. And I'm bringing this up because like the Israelites, we also aren't good at recognizing our role in the chaos and complexity and challenges that come in our lives sometimes. I mean, in going back to the show David Makes Man, when his therapist first brings it up to him that he's creating this chaos, he doesn't believe it. You know, after all, why would he go out of his way to make his life more difficult? And we still see this with Christians today. Um, Some of us are quick to say that any negative situation we find ourselves in is for God's glory. And we're so quick to do this that we ignore how our own bad judgment could have gotten us there. We're quick to think that we're Job and that all of our suffering is a result of a conversation between God and Satan, when the reality is that our suffering is often the result of our own bad choices. And as complex as it is, some of us only feel close to God when we're suffering, which is a whole other topic that I don't have enough time to go into now. But You know, some people really almost feel like they're so used to reaching out to God at times that things are bad and painful that when things are good, they don't know how to relate to God. And so they may subconsciously be creating bad situations because they like how they relate to God in those bad situations. But the goal for this message and this point of the message, at least, is for us to at least understand that a close relationship with God doesn't mean a life without mistakes. Closeness to God does not mean perfection. Remember, David, now I'm going back to the psalmist and not David from the TV show. Um, But David, the psalmist, was considered a man after God's own heart. And this is in spite of his, his sin, you know, with Bathsheba and with killing Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. And if a close relationship meant a life without mistakes, the children of Israel, who certainly had the closest relationship with God out of anybody, Um, the children of Israel um, wouldn't have gone through a lot of what they went through, you know, the wars, being carried off into exile, because, yeah, they wouldn't have made those mistakes. But now I don't want you to think that a a close relationship with God is not important at all. I'm pretty sure both the psalmist David and the children of Israel would have been far worse were it not for their relationships with God. So if we think about it, you see somebody like, well, you know God, you keep making mistakes, like, just remember that they probably be making a whole lot more mistakes without God being in their life. So a close relationship with God doesn't mean that you will always get it right, but it does mean you have a greater chance of turning things around when you realize you've gone the wrong direction. And that is my hope for all of you. But I just wanted to still bring up this particular point that closeness to God doesn't mean no mistakes. So moving on to the second point, is that the mistakes of the children of Israel were written down so that we can learn from them instead of repeating them. So in this passage, at the beginning of it, Paul points out all these stories that I've mentioned already. They they were written in scripture so that we can learn from them. From them. And it's funny that we live in a society that pushes back against the teaching of history. And yes, I'm referring to the boogeyman falsely identified as critical race theory. Um, 
But it's important for us to understand our history, warts and all. Otherwise, we can't possibly learn from it. So in thinking about history, yesterday, First Lady and I had a chance to go to a family barbecue hosted by my paternal grandmother's family. Um, it's a reunion, what's related to a reunion that's been happening since 1954. Shout out to any Coppics, Wilsons, and Harringtons. If you're watching, I appreciate you. If you watch this ever, you know. But family is very important to me. And in fact, I consider myself a bit of an amateur genealogist. People who know me know I have my Ancestry.com account. I have done the genetic testing through 23andMe to get an idea of the regions in Africa that my family came from. You know, I like going through census records and reading about regions where my family lived. Um, but as such, I also like going to family events and talking to the elders in the family to learn more about the things that happened before my time. Because if you know anything with families, you know that things that happen before your time still have an impact on why things are the way they are now. You know, like there are a lot of dynamics that make more sense to me after hearing stories from like a generation or two ago in my family. And I enjoy he hearing these sorts of stories, like hearing about my great grandfather, um, Willie, who was one of the organizers of the reunion that I went to yesterday, or my grandmother, Beatrice, who was one of the presidents of the corporation that was formed to continue um, planning these reunions, because these re reunions, like I said, go back to 1954. So you figure that's a long time for things to go back. Um, or even seeing how proud people are of my father, in spite of the fact that my father hadn't been to these sorts of reunions in decades, but how they still were proud to identify me as Duke, the doctor's son. Because for them, my father's academic accomplishments meant they all accomplished that as well with him. <clears throat> so truth be told, I enjoy family reunions because I enjoy learning about my history, even if it's largely an oral form. It helps me make sense of things I see in the family today, and it gives me a better idea of what kinds of pitfalls to avoid. So in some day, I do plan on writing down a lot of what I've been taught over the years so that the generations that come up behind me will have something <laughs> written to come back to. And not just among the Coppics, Wilsons, and Harringtons on my paternal grandmother's side, but also the Claytons on my paternal grandfather's side, whose ancestral home was near where First Lady and I vacationed a few months ago in Accomack County, Virginia. Or not to mention the Browns and Crenshaws on my mother's side of family who were from Louisiana and, you know, talk about how they ended up in Ohio. And don't even get me started on the origin of the black community in Northeast Philadelphia where I was raised and how the building of I-95 destroyed a lot of it. See, there are a lot of good stories out there that need to be shared and I would like to have a role in sharing them and I would like to have a role <laughs> in preserving them, especially when you consider that many people in this country don't think that African Americans have a history worth knowing anyway. I mean, and then you have to think about it like this. Those who write the history are the ones who have control over how it's remembered. That's why what was the phrase that says, you know, history is always told from the side of the winner. So that's why like so much history has been stilted, especially in the United States. You know, why the perspectives of marginalized groups have historically been left out because they didn't have the power and privilege to get their perspectives heard. But now, you know, things are evening out in that way. And that's why ethnic studies are so important. But when you think about it, the ability to write and the ability to get your story heard is a part of how history itself gets preserved. And that's why if you look back in biblical times, God used Moses, who's considered to be one of the writers, well, who's considered by many to be the writers of the first five books of the Bible known as the Pentateuch, and the Apostle Paul, who was a writer of First Corinthians, which we're reading from today, this is why God would have used them, because back in that time period, most people did not know how to read and write. But Moses, because he had been educated in the court of Pharaoh, and Paul, because he had also been very well educated, were part of that minority that could write. So just saying, writing down history is very important, and we all do have the ability to write down the things that have happened around us and the things we know that happened before us so that we can pass those things on to the generations that come behind us. And I know this was a very long tangent, but you can kind of figure where it's going, which is that 
it is important for future generations to be able to read history. And unlike the history of my family or in the community that I was raised, the children of Israel already had their history written in scripture. They had no excuse not to know what their ancestors had gone through. And in fact, if you do research, even today, you find that there was a Jewish custom where during their transition to adulthood, Jewish children had to memorize the Torah, you know, the books of the law. They had to memorize it. And a good portion of their history is in those books. So the reason this is important for us, though, is that as believers, as people of faith, you know, and thanks to what Jesus did, we now have to understand that history because that history is a part of our history and our heritage as believers as well. Um, so thankfully, because it was written down, you know, because of people like Moses who could write, we have access to it and we have the potential to learn from the mistakes of the children of Israel as well as celebrate in their triumphs because it's all written down for us to review. And what makes this a bit more relevant to this particular passage is the fact that the Corinthians were Gentiles. So just to give some clear, some quick background, there was this bit of a split. The Jews were the people who directly could trace their lineage back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, you know, that sort of thing. But the Gentiles were everybody else. And up until the time of Jesus, the Gentiles had been locked out of everything that God had said for, you know, Jews. So why this is important is that we have to remember that when Paul is talking to the Corinthian church, he's talking to a group of Gentiles. So they actually are not familiar with any of these stories. I mean, why would they be? They weren't Jews. So this, in effect, is Paul doing for them what a lot of us have to do today which is go back and learn the history and the heritage of our faith so that we can also make an effort not to fall into those same traps. And that brings me to my final point, which is that even when we have the extra information and even when we have read about the past, we still shouldn't be overconfident because temptation and falling into temptation is common. So I know that this sermon has been pretty hard on the children of Israel as well as David, the psalmist David, and many others for not learning from their history. However, Paul makes it clear in this passage that it is a common issue, so common that we should not be quick to think that we have everything under control no matter how good we're feeling about ourselves. Why? Because, well, the minute we think we have everything under control is the very minute that we are most likely to fall. And I guess going back to some of what we see in the um, in the milk crate challenges, it seems like the minute that people start getting confident when they reach like the top, the peak of the step formation, is the point that they fall. They usually fall after making it about halfway through. You was like, ah, I got to the hardest part. Now it's over. It's like, no, you still have to come back down these steps. It's not over yet, but. But just saying that sometimes the minute that we think we've got it under control is the minute that we mess up. Or I'll use another example. Sometimes First Lady and I watch American Ninja Warrior. And if you've ever seen it where it's like people get to the point like, oh, I'm almost done. I'm almost there. You can see that the person who's competing, they take a deep breath as they got like to the halfway point of what looks like the hardest um, obstacle. You know, or they're spending so much time looking at the harder obstacle that's coming up next, they look at the easy one, like, oh, I got this, I got this, and then fall off of something that they had no business falling off of because they underestimated it. And that's kind of what, you know, we do. But, you know, when we think about it, this is very common. I mean, and just giving some examples from things that I preached in the last few months. We think back to how the children of Israel lost the Ark of the Covenant after foolishly bringing it into a battle as if it were a talisman. So as if it were a good luck charm and not, you know, a place where the presence of God would dwell. Or we can think back to the story of Samson, who lost his strength because he had grown accustomed to escaping the many traps people were setting for him. So comfortable and so accustomed to escaping that he actually thought he'd be okay even if he 
reveal the source of his strength to a woman who clearly was trying to take away his strength. Like, it was obvious. It was like, obvious. Everything he said that would take away his strength, she did. And he still actually told her. You know, or even when we get to the New Testament, one of my favorite passages in the book of Acts, it talks about the sons of Sceva, who ended up getting beat up by a demon. And they got beat up by a demon because they were a bit too comfortable trying to imitate in this case, the powerful person who just left the region, which was Paul. But we find that this was something that they did. And they, you know, would make money by going back behind people and trying to take some of the shine from the legitimate prophets and apostles who were coming through. And so the point we get is that this kind of thing happens a lot where people think they have it under control and then end up having a rude awakening. And therefore, we should not get to the point where we think, oh, well, I know scripture backwards and forwards, left and right. I can recite this verse, this chapter from this manuscript and from this translation. We shouldn't get to the point where we're like, well, I know this so well that therefore I could never fall in this area. Because the minute you start thinking that is the minute you are going to fall in that area. It's like, <laughs> there's, there's just no way around it. So, you know, in the end, like I've said, you know, we do need to know our history and we need to know that we need to have that close relationship with God. But we also need to understand that the close relationship itself, you know, will make us less likely to make mistakes, but won't make us perfect. And the minute we think that that close relationship and that knowledge makes us perfect, we set ourselves up to fall even harder. So in the end, gaining knowledge is important to our decision making. And like I've said, we have so much information at our fingertips on a regular basis. But that's only a part of the story. Because as I've said, knowledge doesn't necessarily keep us from making bad decisions. So if it doesn't, how can we avoid those bad decisions? Well, the reason that I went down to verse 13 is that the pastor lets us know that God will provide a way of escape from that, from that temptation. And I just wanted to make sure to leave you with this one point of hope in a pretty bleak sermon up to this point, which is that we're not doomed. Because even though it's common for us to get comfortable and to make mistakes and to be tempted and do things to make our lives more complicated than they need to be, we can rest assured that most of the time, God is going to provide a way out. You know, there's often room for us to change our minds, turn around and do something else. And I say often because unfortunately, you know, the reality is sometimes it really is too late. But most of the time, it's not. And we do have room to change our direction. And when you think about how does God do this, how does God provide a way of escape from our temptation? Well, when we have a relationship with him, God can help us to navigate the large amount of information that we have at our disposal, you know, thanks to our technology, thanks to, you know, the fact that we're more educated than people were in the past, we can sometimes suffer from information overload, but God can help us to make the most out of the information that we have before us. And it, God can help us to sift through that information and figure out how to make decisions that still honor him, decisions that have our best interests at heart, decisions that are in line with what God would want for us. And this is out of our relationship with God. This comes out of our relationship with God, which we can build through studying scripture, through praying, through spending time with other believers. So once we do that, then we will start to see things differently and noticing that maybe we have more options in places that we hadn't seen them before. For instance, I mentioned earlier that I do tend to procrastinate. But I also know that most of the time I have the option to start working earlier, even when I don't feel like it. So... Sometimes I'll push myself and be like, well, a little bit of work right now will make me less stressed out later and will make it less likely for this backup on me later. Or maybe you're somebody who also, like me, tends to overpack your schedule because you feel most comfortable when you don't have the time to think. Well, even in those situations, there's still room to delegate. And God may just like raise up somebody around you that you can you know, talk to and share the load of your work with, you know. So just think about it. There are probably instances in your life that are the same way. If you find yourself making your life more complicated than it needs to be, you can stop. 
and you can work on trusting God enough to make sure that you do learn to relate to God when things are good and not feel like you have to be under pressure all the time in order to truly understand what God wants for you. And that brings me back to the milk crate carton that I started with. For the record, I am not anti-challenge. Sometimes challenges are fun. Sometimes challenges are safe. I just use the milk crate challenge in this message because it is everywhere, literally everywhere. And it's a great example of bad decision making most of the time. Because most of the time, people get hurt. Um, but And the unfortunate reality is that we will always have the potential to make bad decisions. And these bad decisions aren't just related to challenges. You know, think of all the people who won't get the vaccine, but are trying to take medicine designed for horses. Or think of all the people who wouldn't social distance, but last year were actually trying to take pool cleaner because they thought it would protect them from COVID-19. Or think about the people who stormed the Capitol on January 6th. You know, while in all these categories, there were definitely some people who were legitimately insane, but many were otherwise normal people who just got caught up and made some bad decisions. And we need to recognize that not everything that looks good to us, you know, is good for us. Like, remember Adam, Eve, and the fruit. That was the problem, right? Eve was like, you know what? This fruit is certainly, it looks, it's pleasing to the eyes. It looks good to eat. It's like, how do you think it looks good to eat if God literally said, don't eat it? Like, <laughs> you know, what is that? But just saying, so everything that looks good to us and looks pleasing to us may not be good for us. But, and here is the good part of this, the more we spend time building our relationship with God, the more likely we will be in a better position to know what kinds of decisions we can make will build us up and what kinds of things we make that would break us down. So in the end, yeah, as the title of this message says, oftentimes we make bad decisions, not because we don't know any better, but because they actually look like good, attractive decisions to us. But we need to keep spending time with God. And as we keep spending time with God, we will have a better idea of what really is good for us and what is not. So God bless you all. And now we are going to open the doors of the church. So I know that the tail end of this message especially spent a lot of time about the importance of building a relationship with God and understanding that we are just like as Paul was writing this, we are in a time period that all of those things that apply to the children of Israel can apply to us. We have access to the same blessings. We have access to the same promises because of what Jesus did by dying on the cross for us. And so if you would like to begin this journey as a believer and start building your own personal relationship with God, the first step of this is to get to know Jesus um, for the pardon of your sins. Um, and so and if you would like to do that, we're going to use some more words written by the Apostle Paul to help us get to that point. So in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 9, Paul writes that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So. If you would like to begin this relationship with Jesus Christ today, all you have to do is repeat this prayer after me. Say, God, I confess that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. Again, that is, God, I confess that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. And if that is you, if you just prayed that prayer, congratulations, you are now a believer and we would love to hear from you. You can write it in the comments. You can send us a contact card. It should be in the link to the um, description of this message. You can also email us and you'll hear back, hear back from me or from our first lady or from our deacon. And we will pray with you and help you figure out your next steps in this journey as a believer. Or maybe you're somebody who feels led to become a part of Your Will Christian Ministries. Maybe you identify as a Christian already and you would like to be a part of the building that's going on behind the scenes. 
you know, there is a lot more that goes into running this ministry than what you see for an hour and some change on Sundays. And we would love for you to be a part of it. We have events going on behind the scenes. We have some exciting plans they're going to be releasing pretty soon. I know I say that every Sunday, but we really do. It's true. Plans take work. And if you would like to be a part of that, if you feel like this is the place where God has planted you to grow and you would like for us as a ministry to continue to grow, we also encourage you to write it in the comments, fill out a comment card, email us, and you'd hear back from me, from First Lady, or from our deacon. And we will also pray with you and help you figure out how we can assist you on your journey as a believer and how we can help you do what our tagline says, which is live God's will for your life. Or maybe you're somebody who's in need of prayer. I know we said this earlier in service, but we'll say it again. Um, If you need us to pray with you, stand in agreement with you, intercede on your behalf, feel free to write your prayer request um, in the comments of today's message if we're live. Or you can also send us a prayer request through the contact card or through an email if you want more privacy. And we will pray with you, we'll pray for you, intercede on your behalf if you need it. And we'll also check in with you periodically to see just how things are going. So if you need that, if you want us to pray for you during service, feel free to type it in the comments now. If not, and you want us to pray for you later, we're still open for that too. And lastly, if you would like some more information about what we do at Your World Christian Ministries, feel free to fill out a contact card and you will receive the emails from us as we um, continue moving forward with our events and our announcements and things like that. So with that, I just want to thank you all for spending this time with us today during service. It really does mean a lot. It's hard to believe that we've gotten through even the month of August at this point, but God is here. God is faithful and we thank him for bringing us thus far so now I'm going to look at the comments to see what we need to pray for. Okay. All right. All right. So since we've already pray- we already did our prayer about the um, those who were impacted by the hurricane, you know, and Sister Michiko's niece. So um, we just see one additional prayer request, and we thank you all for that. So I'm going to start praying right now. Let us pray. Dear God, we just thank you for the privilege to come before you once again. We thank you for the word that was preached and just this time you've allowed for us to spend in the community that you're helping us to build here, where people are able to come together and cast their cares upon you because you care for us. We thank you for the time that we spent in prayer about all those who were impacted by Hurricane Ida. And we just echo all of that once again. We pray that you would continue to just provide a way of escape and that your angels would just encamp around all those who are in the path of this hurricane. Um, We also pray for um, Vicky's trainer whose wife just died We pray that you would be with that family. We know that she died of COVID. We know there's a lot of pain there. And it's just a reminder to us that this pandemic, even though many people in this country, and truth be told around the world, are acting like it's over, it's not over. There are still people who are losing their lives from it every day. And just help us to be able to support those who are still hurting over this those who are still sick over this, those who are losing loved ones, those who are worried about how they're going to be able to go on as a result of this. Help us to truly lead with love and lead with compassion and to truly care about our neighbors as you have commanded us to care. Um, We just thank you again for the privilege to come before you and for keeping us thus far. And we pray that you'll take care of any concerns that we may have We know there are some that have been sick among us, and we pray that you would continue to just show yourself in their lives and be a source of the healing that they need and a source of strength for their supporters who are helping them through these trying times. We know that there are some who are dealing with issues with their interpersonal relationships, and we just pray that you would be a source of peace and that you would make it possible for reconciliation to happen in the places where it needs to happen 
but that you would also make it possible for distance to happen in the place where it needs to happen. We just pray that you would have your way and that you would move in us and move through us, that people will come to know more about you as they interact with us. And now I pray that you would be with us as we leave this place and in this broadcast and go back to our respective lives, that your angels would encamp around about us and your light would shine through us wherever we go and that you'll keep us safe until we're able to come together once again. And now, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us now, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. So, see you all next week, God willing.